The story of the Dana Adobe begins over 200 years ago and 3,000 miles east in Boston. It was there that William Goodwin Dana, a descendant of early American colonists, 18 and orphaned, was sent into service by his uncle, a merchant on a ship bound for China and India. Dana learned the skills of sailing at sea and received a first-class certificate as a navigator upon his return to Boston, where he set off as captain of his own ship, Waverly, several years later. It was during this time he became acquainted with coastal California and recognizing a business opportunity located to Santa Barbara and set up a store in 1825. He also built the first homemade ship in California at age 28. It is believed that that's when he met Maria Josefa Petra del Carmen, one of five daughters of Don Carlos Antonio Carrillo, resident of the Presidio of Santa Barbara, and later a provisional governor of California. But their marriage would be a long time coming. Captain Dana and uh, Maria Josefa Carrillo couldn't get married. He had to ask permission of the governor, Jose Maria Echendia. In Mexico, there was this call to to move people into this area of California, of Mexico, that wasn't um, inhabited very much. So uh, there is a pattern, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the people applying for the land grants were Yankees. Um, so they were foreigners, and uh, the governor was not as happy about that and, and really dragged his feet <laughs> quite a bit there. He needed to become Catholic read and write Spanish. He was really patient and it took over almost a year. At that time, I think one of the letters says, I, I'm done waiting, I'm just going to marry her. <laughs> and eventually they do get married, of course. Now a legal citizen of Mexican territory, California, Dana lost no time in applying for one of the government land grants called ranchos, from which the English word ranch is derived. Land-grant titles gave selected citizens permanent unencumbered ownership rights to large areas of land. Dana was eventually granted the roughly 38,000 acres, 71 miles north of Santa Barbara, called Napomo. Adapted from the Indian word for the area, Napoma, meaning foot of the hills, the Napomo Rancho stretched from the foothills of the Santa Lucia Mountains west to the Pacific Ocean. The restless seamen had, it seems, finally come home. He really did embrace the faith, the culture, the language, and he flourished. And the reason for that is that he had been um, orphaned three times by the time he was nine years old. So I think he was looking for a place to set roots, permanent roots, and he found it here. The captain applied for the good grasses, as he says, of the Nopoma. His cattle needed the good grasses. The role of the Dana family in the Native American Chumash here was, I think, very different from what the missions and what maybe lots of people think about how they were treated. Captain Dana embraced their culture. He paid his workers. They built this house. They were the first paqueros. They knew how to survive in this foreign land. It was with those Native Americans that Dana began work on a house situated on the hill overlooking his land. But it was not a typical Mexican adobe. You really see this coming together, coming overlapping of the culture, coming together with the cultures of that Mexican um, ranchero period with a, a bit of sophistication. Now you have this Greek revival architecture being brought from the East Coast. You have wood floors throughout the house. You have moldings, you have separation of rooms and, and functions of rooms, um, you have a second story. If you could build one, one house, you're going to have a one-room adobe or a two-room adobe. We have a 13-room adobe. <laughs> La Casa de Dana wasn't constructed all at once. Rather, it was added on to over the years as the family grew in number. William and Maria Josefa wound up having 21 children, 13 of whom lived to adulthood. The Danas furnished the house with handcrafted pieces made of precious woods, imported from sea voyages. Leather and fabric were created on the ranch. It was considered very elegant for hacienda life and was a welcome sight to the many visitors. It was part of the code for the rancho era period that hospitality was key. This was the only stopping place between two major missions and it was right off of the El Camino Real 
the King's Highway. So if you were traveling, you could take your old tired horse, replace it with one of his, and then you could come to the house and ask for shelter, for food. You were welcome to stay for as long as you wished. If the Dana family figured you were having a little trouble on your travels, the next morning you would find a little pile of gold coins next to your pillow. Among the family's more storied guests were lawmaker Henry Teft, as well as military officer and explorer John C. Fremont, and his battalion of soldiers who camped on the property. But the family also had to fend against those that weren't welcome. They never knew when they might be attacked by raiding parties of bandits during the dark period in California known as the Bloody Fifties. Crime was rampant, and the area's motes, valleys, and foothill passes made good hiding places for famous criminals. The house was attacked at one point by Jack Powers and his gang. This was like on the other side of the moon, living here. It was very dangerous. You have to build the cupola as a watch post. Someone would go up there and watch for the raiders. The Indians from the Tulares in the San Joaquin Valley would come on over and raid the horses. But the daily danger the family faced wasn't only for man. The land was swarming with wild predators including a legendary giant called El Casador, or the Hunter, a bear that killed so many cattle and sheep, the locals put out a reward for its head. But between the hard work and perils, the house came to life with joy in the form of frequent fiestas. The family, friends, and neighbors would gather on the porch to dance, sing, and play music. And these were times to celebrate. During the gold rush, Rancho Napomo thrived, driving their cattle north to feed the onslaught of 49ers and selling its goods on the open market. California was never the same afterwards. Progress and people encroached. The United States took possession of the territory. William Dana constructed buildings and opened businesses in nearby San Luis Obispo, and through his son-in-law, had a part in crafting the state's constitution. Being in the center of the state, the Rancho became a stage stop and in 1847 was one of four designated exchange points on California's first U.S. mail route. The Pacific Coast Railway also eventually crossed into Rancho Napomo, and for permission to lay tracks, Maria Josefa was given a life pass, which she used until her death in 1888. Plagued by rheumatism, thought to be brought on by his many years spent at sea, towards the end of his life it grew so severe Dana became paralyzed. He was confined to the house and died on February 12, 1858. But some 200 years later, Dana Adobe, the house the couple built, the oldest residence in San Luis Obispo County remains, designated as a California historical landmark. Our roots are here. This is the old Californios that lived here, that established a sense of place, a peaceful life. Come here and time slows down and you just soak in this sense of home, of love, of contentment.